Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Risa Eldon, and I am the Head of Industry Partnerships here at House. We just launched House Pro, which offers an all-in-one solution that empowers home remodeling and design professionals to stand out, win more clients, and manage their projects efficiently and profitably. And today, I am so delighted that Beth Whitlinger is joining us. Um, she is the formerly known as the interior design coach, but has over 40 years of experience and is a professional member of the ASID and certified interior designer in the state of California. Beth, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And before I pass it over to you, I want to tell you all a little bit about Beth and her experience. Beth has worked on projects throughout the world, commercial and residential, in large and small interior design and architectural firms. What makes her different is that she is a working interior designer and has encountered and conquered many of the challenges you face in your design practice, improving the professionalism, and body of knowledge in the industry is a particularly a big passion for Beth and she has been coaching and mentoring home remodeling and design professionals for over 15 years. So thank you Beth for being here with us today. Thank you, Risa. And what are we talking about today? This is one of my favorite topics because I want everybody to be as profitable as possible. So we'll be covering um, how to cover all of your costs, how to create a financial strategy that accounts for anything, and especially now COVID related complications. And um, oh, let's make sure that I can get over here to my next slide. Um, here's a little brief intro and um, a way to contact Beth as well. And here's an agenda of what we will be covering today. So first we'll be going over problem solving, capturing costs, tracking and billing, and then we'll cover you know, improving your cash flow, project management and document control. So are you ready, Beth? Let's get into it. Yes. All right. So here, and we're going to kind of make this a fireside style Q&A. Um, and then we have some questions at the end that we will cover. And I want to reiterate that this is going to really cover a whole slew of things. There's always more we can talk about. But the first thing that I really want to cover is problem solving capturing your costs. So talk to us a little bit about how a home renovating professional or interior designer can make sure that he or she covers all their costs, Beth. Well, I always start each project with a, a project estimator. So this is a four page document with absolutely everything that you could possibly do on the project, whatever your title is. Um, we have found this to be incredibly invaluable to finding all the tasks we do, but don't typically remember to add the time for in the contract or bill for if we're billing hourly. It's the five minutes here, the 10 minutes there. I have mine divided up into the phases of the project and okay. they include the typical project tasks, obviously, plus meetings, reviews, travel time, reselections that always happen. There's always at least one reselection. Phone calls, site visits, all the stuff that you, in, until you start really recording it, you don't realize it's taking up a giant chunk of your time. Um, that I think is something that designers aren't taught to do. Architects aren't taught to do this. General contractors certainly don't seem to do this as they start. And every time I talk to professionals in the home industry, whether it's new build or remodeling, they are um, great at um, doing project management and picking out the items, but the upfront and the back end are the really the hardest part because it's the it's the least sexy of all the stuff we do. It's the the documentation, the counting, all the, the boring stuff, basically. But if you can get your hands on a really good project estimator, um, I think that just goes so far in helping you understand where all your time is going and be able to actually 
put together a fixed fee contract with a lot of confidence or be able to bill hourly but tell the client, we estimate this project is going to take approximately 420 hours and here's why. Mm -hmm. um, I don't typically share that estimator with the client, but mm -hmm. I have in the past where I've had a little bit of pushback on our design fee. I've gone over everything that we do and it can be invaluable educating the client and having them understand really all the things you're going to be doing and how much time they really do take. I, they have no idea. So it's very helpful. And, yeah. And as we had, we were talking earlier today, um, I've included it. We've included a screenshot here of how you can easily do that and really leverage technology with our platform. Um, really try to making, making the process a little bit more streamlined so that when you are presenting to your client, um, not only are you not undercutting yourself, but there's no big surprises. Um, everything is kind of laid out. Obviously, we'll talk about this later in our conversation, but just making sure you account for any changes that do pop come up. As we know, construction, their design, there's always unknowns. So what else, how else do you recommend that a professional can capture costs? Well, freight charges are the easiest thing to forget about. And my process is to enter all the freight charges into the system that I'm using, which happens to be HousePro, um, as they come in and add them to the affiliated PO and the invoice immediately. That way you don't have any worry about, did we bill this freight, did that happen? So we get the bill, we enter it and pay it like that day. So there's no backup of paperwork. There's no forgetting to file it or not knowing if you have put it on the PO, but not the invoice. And it, it's just crazy. That way the client can sign in to their platform um, any day, any time and see exactly all the costs to the minute that have been entered into that project. And, and then it, it helps prevent all those surprises. Um, I explain that process way up front. The client needs to understand this. Surprises are the number one thing for uh, clients firing designers or architects or builders because they say, I had no idea. And they, they're in the middle of a project and they let the professional go and then they're, they're like, what do I do? But uh, if you can answer all those questions up front and let them know that there are a lot of costs that they, if they've never done this before, there are a lot of costs that are gonna come up. As long as you tell them in advance, they're pretty good about it. I do spell it out in my contract and I advise an estimate of about six to 12% of the list value or retail value of the goods are gonna be billed to them after they get the invoice as inbound freight. And I wanna prepare them for all these back-end costs so that they understand what's gonna to come to them. I also, at that time, bring up the information about um, local delivery, pickup delivery, installation, um, that goes true with a, a builder environment as well as a designer environment because there are a lot of things that they think uh, they pay the inbound freight. You know, it's coming from Georgia to California, let's say, and mm -hmm. that's all they think they're supposed to pay. But no, what you've got to get it from the warehouse to their home, and they just need to understand that whole chain of possession and how much it actually does cost to get things to their to their residents, to their project. If you're charging full retail, and you can explain this to clients, typically all those charges are included. So sometimes I will give my client the option and they never pick it. If they, they can pay full retail and I won't be charging them all these little costs or they can pay the designer net plus all the affiliated costs that go with it it's always less expensive to do it that way, yeah. hands down, always less expensive. And then you're uh, tracking that in your, your House Pro account with like a separate line item, and, and you said it's between six and 12%, so where, do you wait until you incur those expenses to build them out, or do you collect the money ahead of time? 
I typically wait to incur the okay. expenses. When I get the invoices, when I add it on. However, if possible, it's great to get freight quotes up front from your vendors mm -hmm. because then I can present those up, up front to the client and they they see it and they understand that that's affiliated with that particular product. But it's it's challenging to get those. And right now, freight costs are varying because of the you know unknowns in transportation that are currently going on yes. so it's not always something that can happen that's why if you have the conversation and they understand that they're going to expect additional charges you know it's 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 not a freak out when it comes to the bill totally totally um great um and then um just in terms of you know other mechanisms that you're using to make sure that you're maintaining the highest level of profit margin um what what other what else are you doing within your flow to ensure you're taking home as much money as possible well anything affiliated with the project should be documented and entered in your project management or accounting software um, with House Pro, it gives you a space to enter uh, billable time and expenses, and it all gets entered against the job. So don't forget charges for blueprints, um, hard copies that you print out of specification books at the at the close, mm -hmm. um, international phone charges. Sometimes, uh, you know, maybe at your office you don't have an international phone plan, and they'll charge you by call. Um, they add up. If you really look at all your expenses and see how much of it can be attributed to a project, you need to start pushing those over to the project so that you can understand what uh, what actually the profit margin on your jobs are. You're, the first couple times you do it, I think you're going to be pretty surprised, unfortunately. But then it gives you the impetus to start doing it and charge more money. Um, you have to check, though, to make sure that reimbursables are taxable in your state, because some reimbursables are taxable in certain states. Like in California, uh, blueprints, if I resell, essentially resell a blueprint to a client, I have to tax it unless I was taxed at the point of sale. So just check the laws in your state and make sure that you're not, um, you know, text at the end of the year like oh you owe us twenty thousand dollars for blueprints <laughs> yeah. oh, i don't want to do that <laughs> such a great yeah such a not fun piece of the puzzle oh, but thank exactly. you. i don't want to do that i don't want to do that if you have a system that's properly managing um, all of that information and its input, it should be pretty straightforward and streamlined. But we always know that there are some weird little nuances um, that can pop up. And and do you recommend to your clients, Beth? And and I don't know because it's probably a different level, you know, gross, gross profit margin um, level of, between like an interior designer versus an architect versus a different tradesperson versus a general contractor. Um, do you recommend a certain number that people should hit or a certain range a percentage wise, or is that kind of specific to like how you're running your business? Yeah, I think it, I think it varies, but um, if you, as far as a profit margin, you're saying, yeah. um, I, you know, they, they're all across the board and it depends on if you're just by yourself, or if you have a staff and uh, you know what your overhead costs are, um, I really try to shoot, if, if you're anything under than 12%, then you need to drastically revamp because that's that you're working for minimum wage. So typically a design firm should be between about 20 and 40%. And that's where if you're, if you're increasing your design costs, meaning your fees, even if this is an architect or a builder, if you increase your fees and lower your upcharge on your goods, you're in a, in a better state no matter what. Um, I think that more clients, because they're getting savvier about product and it's available on the internet, if you can make your whole business model less about the product and more about your services then i think you come out ahead regardless so um interior designers specifically are famous for having abysmal profit margins so yeah. we'll leave it <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's why we're here today. We want to help everybody make more money and work more efficiently. And then under, under this, I wanted to make sure, um, I know we had our next slide talks a little bit about your construction review fee, but before we get to that, did I miss anything else that you wanted to cover? No, I don't think so. Okay, great. So talk to me so, about the construction review fee, Beth. Uh, I add, and I have added for, I. I don't know, 20 years, a construction review fee to any of our remodels or new builds. And the reason why I did this and I started this is because we were noticing that all these costs, all these trips and revisions to drawings, we couldn't have anticipated at the beginning of the project and they weren't in the our original project estimator because how do you know that they're the client's going to change your mind six times and you can't really anticipate a lot of these things or maybe it's a, a contractor that we haven't worked with before or for a contractor it's a designer that they haven't worked with before it, there's a learning curve with that so you you're on site more you're answering more questions you're answering emails the client might you know text you 60 times a day you've got to cover all those costs so the a good way aside from saying okay we're out of scope you know you you're hounding me with text messages is to just have a construction review fee and typically that's between depending on your area and and what you're comfortable with it's between two and seven percent of the total construction cost of the project okay. that gets billed at the back end you have to as a designer you have to be working with the contractor pretty closely so that they understand that they're going to be giving you that information as an architect same thing because you know a lot of times the architects do project management and they're involved in the product project and they're on site all the time i mean a couple times a week there's no way to recoup those costs unless you really can put it into like a little you know package um this what I do is um, bill this at when we get the CFO, which is the certificate of occupancy. Okay. And um, you, you really, I think the best thing to do is to track every minute you are spending on the project and then see, oh yeah, we should have done that. And there are little ways to wrap it up so that it's a little more palatable to the client. And that's why I did that construction review fee because it just seemed more logical in the whole scheme of things to sort of brand it like that. Um, if you, it, I, I just can't stress enough, if you keep track of your time, you will see exactly where you're losing money. Yep. That's we've talked about this so much, Beth. So I'm so glad you bring this up. And I feel like a broken record, but I'm glad that because you've been in this industry longer than I have, but you look younger than I am. Um, um that tracking your time is of utmost importance in our platform with in-house pro within our app, you can literally track your time and mark it as unbillable. And so if you do get audited for any particular reason, if you are the GC, if you are the designer, you have a running log of yes. how much time you spent. And if you're newer to the business, um, and I know we might have time to touch on this later in terms of different business models, but if you're newer to the business and you don't know how long things will take you, how are you supposed to understand your overall sense of profitability if you haven't tracked how much time things take you? And then if you are hourly now and you want to move to flat fee later, not only for this construction review fee, but in general, your business model, you have to have a general understanding of how to get to those numbers. There's really no true industry standards in I've seen bids come in for the same scope of construction, for example, ranging from 80,000 to 250,000, right? There's no industry standards. And now with COVID, things have changed in terms of pricing of lumber, pricing of labor, lead time. So it is really tricky. And I think what you said and drawing it back to how what we're talking about today and how to create a financial strategy that accounts for um, what's happening in the world today, this construction reviews fee and the structure and the percentage that you've set makes a lot of sense in 
how are you supposed to track every single minute? Yes, yeah, still track it on the back end so you have it, but then have this really detailed conversation and have the documentation for your client so your client under understands what this cost is as well. Right. I think this is- this It's a nice bonus at the end of the project, I'll tell you. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So how do you bill out the construction review fee? Do you log it in house pro and you send them, okay, it's going to be $50,000 and you pay a third at the onset, a third in the middle and a third at the end, or how does that payment schedule work? It's all at the end. So the contractor, the, the GC, we call when we get the CFO and say, what was the total budget for the construction? and you know eight hundred thousand dollars and we're like okay whatever was in our contract i mean right now i think we're at like five percent and we we send the bill and it's right then and there and they always want to put it on american express and get the rewards points for it so i'm fine with that <laughs> well so yeah you can take amex through through our platform it's through house which is great um it does charge them a slight percentage fee and i know we'll get to that later but yeah to, to your point like if they want to use the credit card that's great that you have the ability to receive the online payment the money goes into your bank account pretty quickly um yeah. and it's a done deal so i like how you consider that a bonus at the end of the project um and that is interesting of, of how you have that conversation with G, the gc now that means that you really have a great relationship with the gc for the gc to share that information with you because technically and it depends what state you're in um because i don't know if you're a licensed gc beth i don't are you a licensed gc no so sometimes because the contract is between the GC and the client, the GC might need to get the client's approval to give you that information. Right. Has that and ever been a has that ever been a problem for you or have you really yeah. built a collaborative and relationship? With your and GC? here's why it's in the contract. So typically what I do is I send a copy of that page of the contract that has an initial platform for the client to initial that they yep. approve that clause. I just send it to the contract at the onset and say just uh you know we'll be asking you this total at the close of the project got it and, and that gives the release of it. yeah they're fine with it cool. great and that's um well it was it was a topic of conversation that i was supposed to do at a live presentation that you know live events don't exist these days so we've turned everything virtual but really the importance of the relationship between the interior designer the architect and the builder to get along on the project and build those really key relationships so that it is a nice streamlined flow and this is something that isn't like a, a wait at the end of the project to get those numbers from the right. gc well, certainly you do not want any kind of adversarial relationship. This is your team, whether you picked it or not. They are the people who you're relying on. You can't do everything. The builder can't do everything. The architect can't do everything. The designer can't do everything. And if you work together cohesively, it can be lovely. And then you've got a, yet another pool of people to pull from for future projects that you can refer and people can refer you. It's it's really good. So you set yourself up as a professional from the beginning and you work with people understanding where their lane is and where your lane is and you stay in your lane and everybody works together. So it works out nicely. Yep. And that's, you know what, it's to your point, that in itself is, is helping you really make more money because you're working as efficiently as possible. So that's really helping you cover those costs as well. And that leads me into my next favorite point of conversation. You know, I love talking about time tracking and um, tracking and billing and how that works. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, I know we all suffer from time management um, now more than ever. And can you talk through kind of some of your internal processes and habits that help you free up time to really, um, spend less time on admin. I know we were talking earlier about um, sometimes it can feel like you're a paper pusher and you're not really designing and you're not really working with your team and, and, or you're working with your team, but you're not spending as much time on site as you are, you know, behind a computer. Hopefully you're leveraging technology. This is a screenshot of, you know, how easy it is to track time on the go through our app. But talk to me a little bit about that, Beth, because I want to get your perspective on how designers, builders, architects, everybody can really make the most out of how they are billing and tracking their time well always enter your time you have no excuse now not to do it because you have an app you have your computer you can even write it down on a piece of paper but always 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 enter your time even if you're on a fixed fee contract 
or if the time is not billable, you absolutely have to have a record of what time you spent and what you did, how you spent that client's time. Very often we are required to justify the amount of hours that we've spent at the end of a, a project, or you may need it to um, go to them with a why you're out of scope on the project to show exactly here's how much time we spent on drawings. You know, we anticipated we were going to spend 30 hours on drawings. We've spent 300 hours on drawings. And that is a really important document. So need that for if you're out of scope. Um, you also, uh, if you get in any kind of legal issue down the road, the more robust time track you have, the better your position is in any kind of you know case. If you're trying to get a client to pay you money or a client says they just don't want to pay the final fee or something, for you to have that kind of documentation is invaluable. So get make this a habit. Absolutely make it a habit. You have no excuse. With House Pro, it's awesome. You can log it in your phone. You can, like I said, you can jot it down. It can be on a napkin, but make sure it gets entered into the time tracker. Um, you also, there's the little clocks that, that pop up with um, House Pro. You can do um, the, the timer where you're, you're setting it and it's, you're, you're writing in your information and it'll time it for you. So you, it's a no brainer. You don't even have to really think about it. Just please keep a record. And then make sure your employees are as religious as you are about entering their time daily. And I make sure they even have that clock on their desk. So they're entering every time they change. If you're, if you're working on a drawing for something and then all of a sudden you get a phone call, you stop the timer on that and then you start the timer on the next thing, on the, how long you are on the phone with a client. I mean, it is not abnormal for us to be on the phone with a client for you know, 20 to 40 minutes multiple times per day when, when their projects are under construction. So get everybody on board entering their time. And then also any outside resources that you pay that have an affiliation to the project, like a, a independent contractor or um, anybody uh, that you're that you're paying through that that contract. Um, I often assign limited access to outside contractors so that they can have their time right in House Pro against the project. And that ensures that all the job costs are recorded. They can then use that, they can do a little report and use that to give their invoice to you weekly, monthly, however they do it. But if that's not an option, as soon as you get an invoice from an outside resource, enter their time to the project as soon as you receive the invoicing. That's really, really important. Um, I can't stress enough how important the time management part is, and it's the least attractive part of doing um, any kind of design work or, or um, you know, remodeling or, you know, new construction. It's just the, it's the worst and nobody but likes it. We try to make it attractive for you, Beth. We try to make it as easy as possible. What I wanted to say is you totally hit the nail on the head here is that little voice button right there where it says description meeting. You can literally press that button and you can talk into the phone. Like those of you who use um, the voice activation thing. I just used it when I was playing around with this and it's so easy to put a lengthy description in there. Again, like you, if you don't want to submit this to your client and you're just keeping it for auto, uh, audit right. purposes, you can click over here and click over this so that says non-billable, this little blue tab right here, um, so that you're not submitting it, but you can just have it for internal hours for this project. Um, and that is so quick and so streamlined. And as I mentioned, because I feel like I sound like a broken record and I feel like you and I are always doing this and I used to manage an interior design firm and nobody would ever track their time. I was like, I know everybody worked 40 hours this week. And then at the end of the week, I would look in and see that only 10 hours were logged between three people. So it was just like, we're, we were constantly in the red just because people couldn't track their time properly and going back and trying to track your time is no, it's impossible to do it in arrears. So you absolutely have to be on top of it all the time. And this is what I tell uh, new people. Um, you get paid from that format. So if they don't track their time, they're risking not getting an accurate paycheck. If you've only entered three hours, um, 
you know, really, I'll, I'll say that when they, when they're out of touch with that, I'll say, do, do you, did you only work three hours this week? Oh my God. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll go back and get my time. Well, the bad thing about that entering it, let's say on a Monday for the previous week is you can't remember how you spent your time. Then it's really not that accurate. And if you are billing hourly, it's really not fair to the client unless you're giving them a really realistic snapshot of how much time you've spent on that project. So I am like, before the end of the day, even if I have to pay for 10 minutes of admin time that's not billable, I'd rather do that if they log their time at the end of the day, or I log my time at the end of the day, then have to remember what I did, you know, a week ago. Who can remember that? You can, but, especially you know, now. Especially now. No, no, no time. I mean, time has no meaning right now. It's just we we were talking about this earlier. It's it's crazy. You you have to get yourself reined back in and on a schedule, and. I mean, I, I make a plea to this because there is no other way to accurately evaluate the profitability of each project. Absolutely none. You have to make sure that you've got a real-time snapshot and you um, it enables you to, to pull back or to move forward. Let's say you are um, way out of scope, you can make adjustments before it's too late, before you say, oh my gosh, you know, we've we've used a hundred hours more than our fixed fee contract, for example. How would you know that unless you're tracking your time? Mm -hmm. But um, with House Pro, you can go in and and look at exactly what's been built to that project. You get a real-time snapshot and you can check in with that all the time and really see where you are and how profitable your job is. It shows you a little graph. It's like super simple. Love that. And then and then my question to you then, Beth, is how do you plan for the unexpected? And how do you account for that? What does that look like for you? Well, unexpected as far as um, things that happen on the job, exactly or like change orders or like something was bid at a certain thing and you have to go in and ask for certain money like how do you manage that well we do a change order and okay. there's a, a new feature coming out in house pro um i know for contractors it's already there but for designers it's something that is a, a future develop that um puts it right there in the platform and you just send it to the client. You always want to get it in writing. You always want to have the client sign. It is a legal document. A change order can be a lot of money. Um, I know a lot of uh, smaller residential designers do not use change orders, <clears throat> but it actually is in your benefit because let's say they've asked you to do uh, you know, you've done a kitchen remodel and they're like, oh, you know, we love how this is going. Let's add the laundry room. Well, how do you do that? Do you just say, okay, sure. And then you're just adding it on and you're doing it for free. No, you have to say, how are we billing for this? Would you like me to bill hourly? Do you want me to do a separate contract? And then once once they give you their answer, whether you're a, you know, anybody, a builder, an architect, then you come back with that change order and it's got an amount or an agreement to go hourly and they're signing it and that becomes an addendum to your contract. You absolutely have to do change orders in writing and get a signature or an approval for it. So in um, House Pro, the client can say approve and it you print that out, it becomes part of the part of the document that, you know, if you ever have a problem down the road, you just say, oh no, but you signed this. You signed this with <laughs> So yeah, you you've got covering your bases. Yeah, I think to your point, it's so it's so important, and I think sometimes you get so into the project that you can overlook that, or even if you're a GC and like you're on site and you're moving really fast, and it's COVID, and there's things that can be missed or things that can be changed, but accounting for that is crucial for you to make sure that you're covering all your costs because if you don't have that signed document and you do the work and you're a GC and you're waiting to get paid back, well, the client could say, I never agreed to that. Exactly. exactly. Right. And that does happen frequently. Um, it, you never are too busy 
to take one minute and step back from the situation and evaluate what needs to happen next. If they're, they're changing direction or somebody throws a fly in the ointment, you just have to take a breath and figure out how you're going to financially account for that variance in, in the project flow. And it's really important to make sure that you are protected legally as well as financially. Yep, cannot agree more. Did we cover all of our pointers that we wanted to cover in tracking and billing? I think so. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit about before we dive into the project management and document control. Beth, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, improving cash flow, getting paid faster, getting paid online. What is your process there, and what does that look like? I know we touched on it a little bit earlier when we talked about Amex. So you're always going to get paid faster if you offer an immediate way to pay the invoice you've sent your client. Even if you don't accept credit cards, you can take payment via multiple online sources. Waiting for a check to arrive in, in the mail is completely inefficient and it's just not, nobody really does that anymore. Um, it is challenging and um, you often can wait uh, you know, a month to get a payment from a client because they're going to shove that piece of paper on the back burner and whenever they get to it, they're going to get to it. But if there's a way to pay right when they're opening your invoice online and it says pay and they click pay, how easy is that? So I always suggest with my um, coaching clients to do that. We've, we love having that option for our design clients. It's really, really just super efficient. Um, if you take credit cards, you can consider adding a few percentage points to your overall markup to compensate for the fees, or um, House Pro allows you to charge a transaction fee to the charge. Um, you have to check though if that's allowed in your state, but it will um, cover the, the costs that you're being charged to process that credit card payment. Uh, it passes it along to the client. So sometimes my my clients balk about this. And if I know that the client is going to be kind of like, oh, I don't want to pay the 2% or whatever it is, I just add the 2% to the markup, frankly, because I, I'm not going to pay it. I Sometimes, you know, when if you think about it, our typical project is between $100,000 and $600,000 of a budget. And that's a giant amount of percentage points that we have to pay if all of that is paid in on a credit card. That's a huge, huge chunk of change. I don't yeah. want to lose that money. So uh, no, I'm not paying for it. They're going to pay for it regardless of whether it's you know obvious or not. Um, yeah, it, it's it's definitely going to be passed along to the client. Um, yeah. The other thing I wanted to make sure that everybody understood is not paying for client goods before the client has paid for them. So our rule of thumb is that if the vendor requires payment in full, we collect payment in full from our client. If the vendor requires 50%, we require the same from the client. Even though you know the client's 50% is gonna be a little bit different than our 50%, unless we're passing through complete um, net net pricing but that way you're never out of pocket and you don't have to scramble at the last minute to get paid for something or, or pay a bill when you are waiting for something to ship and time is of the essence with covid right now i've had um this bent crab it forever um, because they were waiting to get payment and the client didn't want to pay that final balance for whatever reason i mean i think they were legitimately i think they were out of town but yeah. i was like oh come on you know i got the little flag in in house pro because i put those little flags on and it'll say oh this invoice is due or this po is due and i sent them the email and crickets so i thought oh my gosh well okay it sat on the dock for a month because i didn't have any feedback from the client you do not want to have your money in the interim that you're just paying that um because your money can be earn, earning interest, although it's you know crappy interest at 1% or something, but yeah. I mean, you really shouldn't outlay any capital on the client's behalf. That shouldn't happen. You're using client funds to pay for goods, P 
period. It shouldn't be any other way. Okay, that totally makes sense. Um, and then, so you set up the reminders in your House Pro account that has little nudges, which is awesome. Um, you are collecting a deposit or retainer, obviously. If you're a GC, you can only collect a certain amount. Um, if you're a designer, it can be a little bit different. Um, so that is really helping you improve your class, your cash flow. You're taking online payments. That's speeding up the process that you're getting paid. Um, so obviously, if you have any outgoing money that you need to pay, you can pay that faster. Any other pointers there in terms of cash flow? Well, as you get expenses bill them out so don't wait until the end of the project to bill you know freight charges or any other job related expenses and you know a lot of firms i think wait to do their billing like uh, maybe monthly mm -hmm. i do it weekly and the reason for that is that the small chunk is a lot easier for the client to deal with than the month of time that we've spent if we're billing on a um, hourly basis so it's a lot easier to swallow in smaller pieces so i would encourage people to do that if you can just maybe set aside like friday afternoons and you just go through and you you send out your invoicing um, we do it monday mornings we make sure that Every Monday morning, I do it between about eight and 10 o'clock, and I go through everything to make sure that uh, purchase orders are, are handled and invoices have been sent out, are all the costs built, and just kind of do a little mini review each week. And that way I'm totally on top of what's going on and can see all the projects and, and what needs to be built and what, what's already been handled. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That's super smart. And then talking a little bit about project management and document control, um, let's talk a little bit about, and I know we touched a little bit about like how important it is to have things documented, but I wanted to hear your take on really how you've leveraged, you know, our, our tool to manage your business in terms of the software you're using, timeline, keeping records. So let's hear it. I love, and this is a relatively new feature on House Pro, but I love that I can go into a document and see its timeline. And in fact, I was briefly telling you, I used this yesterday, almost for the first time, I think. I, I think I knew that it existed, but it's relatively new. And um, I did, um, Oh, I let a little, I let some stuff fall through the cracks. So I had a <laughs> say, oh, did we order the door hardware for the Idaho house? And I paused and said, let me get back to you on that. I, I'm sure we did, but let me just double check. And then I, I hung up and thought, oh no, I, I don't think we did. But I looked on House Pro and I, I checked and I, there wasn't an invoice. So that immediately when we order product it becomes an invoice so I thought okay so I don't know what I did here so I went back and I looked at there was a proposal and there wasn't a PO and I looked at the proposal and I saw the date that I sent it to him it was you know July 3rd or 4th or something like that and oh okay so that explains it because then I just checked out the following week and I, I did I don't know I had like a time travel episode and I didn't do what I was supposed to do but this was good because it would have flagged me anyhow when it said because I set the reminders but I I was able to catch it before it became you know three weeks late or something and right. said oh okay you know I yes I can I we ordered that it's fine and I wasn't lying because right at that minute I was talking to him on the phone I pushed the PO send to the vendor and it was ordered. <laughs> it worked out fine. But um, you have to make sure that whatever project management software you use, it can give you an overview of not only the project, but the status of every piece, every item that you ordered, as well as on every document. And having a timeline of when you set a proposal, if it was approved, how it was paid, when the PO was issued, if an invoice was billed, just like I explained, it's paramount to project efficiency because had I not had that, what what would I have done? I would have not been really sure 
if we had ever issued, I would have had to make a bunch of phone calls. And then I would, I mean, there it's a possibility I could have double ordered the product. So, you know, none of those things are good. Um, I, I know we talked about this a little bit, but I also keep a paper record. And I know everybody wants to be paper free, but I keep a paper record in the client folder of all the documents. I don't print out proposals, but I do print out invoices. And um, we do have a master purchase order book at the office because every so often we have a blackout or I can't access the internet or a computer goes down, is glitchy, our network has a problem, a server is it, it, you know, or whatever um, you just it pays to have data on hand so you don't experience downtime due to circumstances that are beyond your control and then at the end of the project we do a lovely little um, project folder for the client okay. which is a little binder and it includes um, all their specification data we have little um, spec sheets of each product and we put it in tabs by room and um, have a picture on the front of the notebook that shows their, I mean, the actual um, photographer images when, when we do shoot their, their project. If not, we just okay. do little, little shots. Um, we also like to do a before and after page, which is really fun. And it just gives, it leaves behind like a little, you know, memento, and then it's easier for them to um, have a record of what they ordered and um, when and how much they paid for it. Of so. course, so you're sp you're printing out those spec sheets from your House Pro account from like their invoice that you sent them. You're it's printing out each individual item and you're putting it together in a package. And then do you also include care gu a care guide in there? If it's like a certain sofa and it has to be cleaned a certain way, does that is that included in there or is that detail already on the proposal that you've sent them through House Pro? No, you know, I I oftentimes include it if it's something very specific, I will include the attachment. Okay. Um, it's always nice to have. Clients sometimes don't click on the attachments. They don't, uh, you know, for whatever reason, they just don't. But um, in that project notebook, we include care instructions and we include warranty instructions. So oftentimes there are specific warranty instructions on uh, like appliances or patio furniture that we like to include in the back as well. Like if you have two years and they're waiting until like the two year line for some reason to tell you there's something wrong and they're like, hey, Beth. And then you're like, well, I told you. Sorry. Hey. You have it in your warranty baggage. Yeah, exactly. I like that. I like that communication. I think it makes it really clear for the client. And it's nice because it's not, I mean, a lot of double work for you if you've already created your your proposal or your invoice um, in House Pro and you literally are just clicking print and then you're collating and putting everything together for the client. It's kind of like a nice send off package, like, here you go. Thanks for your project. Um, and then they feel really tended to. And then if they have any questions, they can actually flip through that. You also have obviously the client dashboard that you could share them on where it shows all of their paid invoices um, and any outstanding invoices. And then at the bottom, it will show those attachments so that if you had a, a client um, per se that was a little bit more tech savvy and liked, didn't want the paper, um, could just go log in there and open the attachments that way. And you can give them that link so they don't have to keep, they don't have to log in or anything like that. They can access that at any time. Absolutely. The, the advantage that I've found in the past of doing the printout at the end is that it it's almost like a little present you're giving them it's a leave behind it's a deliverable yeah. and we've gotten we've gotten work from that because they pull that out at dinner parties and show their their friends and just that level of documentation mm -hmm. it, it puts us in a different category than maybe you know a, a designer home remodeling professional that didn't do documentation that they worked with in the past they see oh no this is this is the real deal we want to use this going forward so it's it's gotten us business that's super interesting and that's one of the goals you've known me for a long time um with our software that we want to help make you look professional and make you look branded and if you have this 
print this package that you could print out that you use it, the whole thing is not doing triple the work right and for you if it's easy to just print it out give it to them it obviously does take a little bit of time to do that but if that can help you get more work from that really professional presentation and brand that is amazing that's like the best kind of scenario because at the end of the day the money they're actually paying for you to put together that spec book i'm assuming in yes. your hours you've accounted yes, yes absolutely so it's like a, it's a win-win right yeah. um, yeah. you're, you're getting more work so love to hear that um i do want to make sure i had a couple of questions for you i want to make sure i get to them we have a couple minutes left here um what um any, any other tips and tricks that you think might be helpful to our audience that I missed today? Um, hmm. Or any other words of wisdom you wish someone had shared with you when you first launched your business? Huh. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, I know that when people are thinking about a career, um, anything related to, to home remodeling or new builds, you know, architects, designers, even general contractors, it seems um, more glamorous than it actually is. Most of what we all do is behind a desk, albeit at a computer, but, you know, it used to be at a drafting board. You're in the office. Yes, you're creating, but that is like 10% of the work. The rest is project management, and that's where a, a great robust software comes in so handy because it's not what we all like doing, but it's absolutely a necessity. So if you can have a really good software that's taking that horrible time management part away from you, essentially, it's like it's it's as easy as it can possibly be. Then. Um, you know, it makes your job a little easier. It gets you focused more on the time that you can create. But realistically, um, anything related to our industry is more about project management and paperwork than it is about the creation part. So I, I think, I don't think I would have changed my idea of profession, but I kind of would have liked to have known that before I went into it, thinking that it's just going to be like glamorous. I was going to be picking colors and fabrics all day long. And yeah, that that's not real. That doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. It's so crazy thing. But that's, you know, why we're here. We want to help leverage technology, even if you want to print some documents out um, to really help you along that journey. And, and one last question that I wanted to ask you, um, this came in earlier um, this week, um, just really an interesting question. Somebody that's re-entering the workplace, she took time, or sorry, re, she took a break from her design work to have a baby. And um, she's trying to get her bearings now that, you know, there's COVID and this is our new normal. Um, and she's asking, have you, you all, have you started padding your hour estimates for new projects, knowing there will be additional time spent sourcing ordering, tracking purchases due to back orders or scheduling, coordinating trades separately because they can't all be on site working at the same time. And this really hones in on what the topic is we're talking about, covering all of your costs. Well, your costs are different now that they, they were. I know lumber, redwood's harder to get, harder to come by. And you don't want to just use, if you're a GSC, you don't want to use bad redwood. You want, if you're building a deck, you want to use the top of line stuff. So you're having to wait longer. So the project timeline is taking longer. Um, how are you accounting for this extra time, Beth, in your projects? And what do you recommend in terms for GCs, for architects, for designers, for, for everybody, for tradespeople in this situation and, and without it making your client mad and um, with being, being reasonable? Because I think there is some, yes, we are in a global pandemic, but, but we can still do your project, but we have to do it a little bit differently. Do you have to add an addendum to, like you said, like a change order because the costs have changed? How are you managing that? Well, we have accounted for that upfront in our project estimator, and we've added 20% as just a, on the bottom line. We'll go through our regular project estimator and then say, you know what, though, this is not going to be normal because we can't run the job like we used to where we have multiple people like this person is in that room and that person's in that room and we've got it people literally on top of each other trying to get that project done faster 
the lead times are longer now, everything is taking way longer. So yes, you are touching that job a lot more than you know a year ago, let's say. And um, I th we've just used that 20% factor in right. our project estimator, and we don't we don't give that information to the client and say, oh, we're adding 20%. It's just the price is the price. And if they want to go with us, then great. Um, but I think that um, it's probably going to continue on like this for a while. And I, I don't see any quick end in sight to that. So we may just, that, that may just be an adjustment that we make going forward on uh, our fees. Uh, I think that clients are willing to pay for professional services and especially now they want to know that they're hiring someone who has all the boxes checked who has all their ducks in a row and who understands how to keep them safe as well as move their project along so it's really important that whole project management piece of it is very important to continue on during all this crazy time. Yeah, and client communication and communicating with your subs and communicating with, if you're doing and communicating with the architect, the designer, everybody that's involved so that you, and, and, and really clearly defining, like you said, like not saying it's an extra 20%, like the price is the price. I guess it's also interesting for somebody that's re-entering and took a break prior to COVID and is coming back to, you know, six months later, if they took time off for maternity leave to come back and be like, wow. And hopefully they're restarting new projects. So it's just like the price is the price. I think where it got a little tricky for some home design and renovating professionals is when they were in the middle of the project. If you're GC, you have right. to submit or you have to say, hey, sorry, global pandemic, like this is now, and the client has to sign off on that. And yes, the client will well, be. Yeah. Present, In that case, I think I would probably issue a change order, understanding that, you know, we're, we have additional costs now, or shift to hourly if you were on a fixed fee and say, you know, it, this, these are circumstances beyond our control, and I'm going to, I'm going to shift you to hourly because we really need to, to, you know, handle all the, the extras going forward. Um, be transparent with them is perfectly fine. I um, think that for anything new, you have to understand that you are, we're in kind of a different zone with, at least with interior designers, they're, not all of us are working right now. And a lot of people have taken early retirement and a lot of people have just said, I'm just going to spend this time with my kids. So there, there are fewer of us out there. So you can charge more money. I swear, you really can. Um, you just have to do baby steps. And maybe for somebody re-entering the workplace, if you are um, taking a job, you just do it at what you think is going to cover your costs at first and do the time tracking and then be able to say, all right, here's what where I need to add more and here's where I need to take away or I need to add more overall and you really will have a better understanding of how you're spending your time and be able to explain that to a client legitimately going forward. That sounds super reasonable and a really realistic approach. I cannot thank you enough for your time today, Beth. Um, I'm so grateful for you spending time with me and sharing your knowledge and expertise with our community. Um, and if anybody wants to learn more about HousePro, you can feel free to email us. I'll drop the email in. It's um, e uh, grow at house.com. And of course, we'll set you up with an interactive walkthrough. Um, Beth, Thank you again so much for your time. We are so grateful and hopefully everyone can go home and um, implement this right away. And I think the key takeaway here, if I hear anything um, and I wanna check in with you guys is that you are tracking your time, track your time. And um, Beth, you're just amazing. And thank you again for your time. Thank you. Bye everyone.